Okay. Let's, uh, let's get to it. It may seem like a truism, what we're talking about in this session, because my guess is, uh, and Brad, you're going to have to turn off your tie. I can't see anybody. <laughs> but, uh, uh, now, now listen, uh, probably 99% of us in this room believe that when the Bible talks about Israel, it means Israel. Amen. Okay, so... Uh, but we do have to work through that, and we can't just say that. We have to actually show that from the Bible. And so uh, I decided to, to try to uh, do that in this uh, particular presentation. What is the meaning of the word Israel in the Bible? And I'm going to start with a little roadmap for my presentation. I'm going to give some theological significance to the question. I'm going to give some stats. That may be the boring part, except for you statisticians out there that love that kind of stuff. Old Testament usage, New Testament usage, and some special issues. I'm going to deal with some of the problem passages that are thrown at us. There are two major ones that are thrown at us. Uh, and I think it's interesting that we only have two. And we have a couple thousand to throw at them. Okay. Uh, first, as to the theological significance, you know, as I make this presentation, to study uh, what Israel is in the Bible requires more than just a word study of the word Israel, but that's primarily what I'm going to do. I'm going to track through uh, the word Israel and its use in the Bible. Uh, but we would have to study for a complete, a full-orbed biblical theology and a systematic theology built upon the biblical theology. And by the way, that's the only way to do systematic theology. It's build it upon biblical theology, uh, and we will come to some conclusions about land. I think tonight Randall's going to talk to us about whose land is it, and we have to deal with that all the times that God says it's my land. And then that means He has the right to give it to somebody. That's right. Okay. Uh, then we have to deal with other expressions like people of God. And by the way, that expression "people of God" only occurs five times in the Bible. Now, the word peoples and people we'll see is a lot bigger uh, than that. So we would have to explore all of that. And we don't have time to do that in one session. Okay. Um, and so uh, we're going to stick to the word Israel primarily. There's one little thing at the back end of this that I'll change and, and do a little bit different. I'm going to start with this. I gave you this quote two years ago here at the Chafer Conference. But I kind of flew through it. And I want to slow down. Oswald T. Alice was a, was a covenant theologian. He's with the Lord now, so he's probably not covenant anymore. <laughs> he was a good man. He was our brother in Christ. He did a lot of good things, standing against higher criticism and other, other evils. Um, but he couldn't understand or really countenance our dispensational theology that was Zionist in orientation. And in his 1945 book, The Prophecy and the Church, he makes an astounding claim that I don't think any covenant theologian will be honest and make that claim today, even that's really where they are still. So I wanted to walk through this quote. It's one of the most remarkable quotes from the covenant side about what you and I believe about Israel. Would you like to see this? Okay. I'm going to give it to you whether you want to or not. First, he says, literal interpretation has always been a marked feature of premillennialism. In dispensationalism, it has been carried to an extreme. So in a sense, we are uh, dispensationalists are theological terrorists. <laughs> he says, we have seen that this literalism found its most thoroughgoing expression in the claim that Israel must mean Israel. This is a scholar. This is a Presbyterian scholar writing this, and he's quite serious. That this is, it's an extreme position to say that the word Israel means Israel. And that the church was a mystery unknown to the prophets and first made known to the Apostle Paul. 
Now, if the principle of interpretation is adopted that Israel always means Israel, that it does not mean the church, then it follows of necessity that practically all of our information regarding the millennium will concern a Jewish or Israelitish age. Now, when Jesus comes back, what city does he come back to? It's not Washington, D.C. In fact, Washington, D.C. might not be here when he comes back. Okay, he's coming to Jerusalem, the Mount of Olives across the Kedron Valley, marching into Jerusalem. And so there is this Jewish or Israelitish age that appears to be a problem for them. So they don't like it that Israel means Israel. Why don't they like that? Because of the conclusion that is drawn from that. That you have kind of a Israeli flavored kingdom with the Jewish people and their kingdom, Messianic Jews, at the heart of that kingdom. And that bothers them. And so that's an important issue for us. Are we, uh, are we going to stick to our guns about little interpretation? And by the way, little interpretation uh, doesn't mean that we don't believe in figures of speech or symbols. Little hermeneutics is a technical term in the field of hermeneutics that refers to grammatical and historical interpretation. Amen. And that's what we mean by that. And they try to throw the other at us. I mean, I, when Jesus comes back, do you believe he has a piece of steel hanging off his tongue like Revelation 19 says? I don't believe he has a piece of steel. That's a figure of speech. It's defined for us already in the Old Testament. And we believe in progress of Revelation. It talks, it's the instrument of the mouth as a weapon. And he's going to speak the word. He, after all, he's the creator who spoke everything into existence. He can speak the word and speak people out of existence. Amen. And that's what he's going to do at the second coming. Well, that's figurative language. And we believe that. But what we do believe is that we're not running around hunting for non-textual meaning. The meaning has to be in the text. So just like we want our J U.S. Supreme Court judges to follow the U.S. Constitution and its text. Right. And we had a good taste of that today, if you haven't heard. Um, we, in our Bible study, believe in getting at the meaning of the author, the intended meaning of the author, as revealed in the written text. And so that's a battleground. And that's why... We have to discuss what does Israel mean in the Bible because there are those who disagree with us and in fact attack us very strongly on that very point and it seems kind of basic to us. So we need to address it. Well, let me give you some stats. And by the way, if you want a full orbed theological significance of the word of Israel or the concept of Israel, go by Arnold Fruchtenbaum's book, Israelology. And I think that will help you. Some stats. The word Israel occurs, according to my logos, <laughs> using NASB. I didn't verify every occurrence of logos. I have found some mistakes on occasion. Uh, but 2,583 times in the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament. And I did not study each one for theological significance. Now, in the New American Standard Bible, I, went, I searched about what are the words that occur the most often? So I tried to go through that. And by the way, the word church in the English Bible only occurs 112 times. Okay, well, what word occurs the most in the Bible? The word the. <laughs> 62,589 times, according to Lagos. And NASB, and I did not verify those to see if they are <laughs> theologically significant. Uh, I know that some of them are, uh, but I didn't go through every one. And then the second is the word and. <laughs> Only 38,000 times slipped up a little there. But then the word Lord and the various forms of it, whether it's um, uh, Yahweh Jehovah, uh, whether it's Adonai, well, it's Kurios in the New Testament or other a couple other terms, almost 8,000 times that occurs. Then the word God, well, it's Elohim in the Old Testament or 
theos in the Greek New Testament around 4,600 times. People or peoples as a term, 3,858 times. The word Israel, what did I say the church was? 112. Now, if you throw in Ecclesia from the Septuagint Old Testament, people will make that more. Uh, but that just simply means assembly, as we'll talk about later on. But Israel here, 2,583 times. The word man, 2,294 times. And then it falls down off of that. I'm just curious about those. I'm a math major from college, so I was interested. Just where is that going? In Israel, we're talking about a major term in the Bible. Isn't that right? When I was a teenager, my parents had given me a Bible. My, I was not raised in a believing home. My parents gave me a Bible. I mean, in Alabama, everybody's given a Bible <laughs> in the Deep South. It's just culture. Uh, and I started reading it. I was about 12 years old, 13 years old. I started reading it. And... Uh, Something happened when I was 13, and it was the Six-Day War. And I remember we were visiting my grandmother's house in June when that happened, and I was, I was mesmerized by the news as a 13-year-old kid, never been to church at all in my life. And I'm watching the news, and they're talking about Israel. And I had just been reading my Bible. You know, I went Genesis, Exodus, a little bit about Leviticus and then I skipped the numbers. <laughs> you know how that goes. Uh, and so I'm reading about Israel and now I'm mesmerized about Israel and about Israel here on the TV screen. So it's a very important thing and it clicked in my mind that I probably need to pay attention to this. And I think that's the first time that the whole issue of Israel kind of crystallized in my head but I wasn't a believer yet. I didn't become a believer until my senior year in college. Um, now in terms of Old Testament usage, the word in the Old Testament, 2,507 times. I'm searching there in BHS, the Hebrew text. And there are three ways that it is used. It's important that we nail this down. And I, I've never found it to mean C-H-U-R-C-H. -H. It means the man named Jacob, whose name was changed. The descendants of Jacob, the 12 tribes of the Hebrews. And the 10 northern tribes, sometimes called Ephraim, after the division of the kingdom. Those are the three ways that the word Israel is used in the Old Testament. Concerning the man named Jacob, the first occurrence is Genesis 32, 38. He said, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Israel, depending on which way you take um, God there as the object or the subject, you end up with he strives with God or God fights. Of course, that comes from the passage where Jacob is wrestling with the angel of the Lord. You remember that passage. Uh, and uh, from that, he recognizes he's in the presence of God. And God changes his name. Now, the descendants of Jacob, sons of Israel, they're called 645 times. Tribes of Israel, 52 times. 12 tribes of Israel, five times. 12 tribes, 10 times. 12 tribes of the sons of Israel, one time. Revelation 21.2, I added a New Testament there. Let's walk through some of the passages in more detail. Because remember, the covenant guys are going to have a theological definition. Our theological adversaries are going to have a theological definition. And they're going to try to see church in this. And so they're going to do th things like the church is the collection of all the saved of all time either starting with Adam or Abraham. Uh, so we need to walk through the passages 
as they are. Deuteronomy 9.1, then Moses summoned all Israel and said to them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and the ordinances which I am speaking today in your hearing. Deuteronomy 9.1. Uh, Deuteronomy 6.4, I may have that. That should be 6.1 maybe. Deuteronomy 6.4, Hear, O Israel, the Shema. The Lord is our God. The Lord is one. Who's he talking to? He's talking to the tribes of Israel, the Israelites in the wilderness. There's 9-1. The other one was 6-1. Hear, O Israel, you are crossing over the Jordan today to go in to dispossess the nations greater and mightier than you. He's talking to the nation, the tribes. Deuteronomy 23. He shall say to them, Hear, O Israel, you are approaching the battle against your enemies today. Then I'm going to skip over to the prophets, give an example. Amos 3. If you have your Bibles, let's, uh, let's kind of go over there. Amos has a very good preaching style. I like his homiletics. He starts off talking about the sins of everybody out there. It's kind of like the preacher in your church. Attacking all the sins of the world out there before he blasts you for your sins. And that's what Amos does. Goes to all the nations around Israel, attacks them for their sins. Talks about God's judgment on them. And then he goes to Judah. And remember, he's the, you know, and I resonate with him, being a southern boy sent up to Pennsylvania. Uh, I resonate with him. He was the southern prophet sent up north. And he's talking to Israel. And then he starts talking about the sins of Judah, the southern kingdom. Then, you know, the whole rest of the book is about the sins of Israel, the northern kingdoms. But in chapter 3, before he heads down the trail, most of that, uh, he says this, Hear this word which the Lord has spoken against you, sons of Israel, sons of Jacob, the man Jacob, against the entire family which he brought up from the land of Egypt. You only have I chosen among the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. And I think there he may envision what's going to happen in chapter 9, the kingdom brought back together, north and south, as one whole. But he's talking about the choice, the chosenness of the people, which we saw uh, back in Deuteronomy. God had to choose someone, didn't he? I don't know. Some of the Jewish people today have told me they wish he would choose somebody else yeah. <laughs> because of the persecution. I, I resonate with that desire. I understand that, but Messiah had to come through some family on earth, and God chose the Jewish people, the Hebrews, the Israelites, the Jews. Uh, and so in this, uh, Israel equals Jacob. Verse 11 in chapter 9, let's go over to chapter 9. In that day, I will raise up the fallen booth of David and wall up its breaches, and I will also raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old. He's going to bring about a united kingdom like it used to be. Now he's, Amos is writing 800 years or so before Jesus. Uh, and then in verse 14, also I will restore the captivity of my people Israel. And captivity there means ruin. So it may, may not be referring to the Babylonian captivity. It might, uh, or though it might not refer to that. But the general ruin of my people, Israel. Okay, and there you see the word people applied to Israel. And they will rebuild the ruined cities and live in them. They will also plant vineyards and drink their wine and make gardens and eat their fruit. But notice verse 15. I will also plant them on their land and they will not again be rooted out from their land which I have given them, says the Lord your God. Amen. I sometimes will put that on the overhead next to the end of Romans 8. In Romans 8, nothing will separate, nothing 
Absolutely nothing will separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. And we take that at face value, do we not? Isn't it one of the most beautiful promises we have as Christians? And then I put up Amos 9, I look at that. Shouldn't we take it at face value, just like it says? And the answer, of course, is yes. It's a prediction and a promise from God that one day they're going to be in their land never ever to be taken out again. The cycles of Deuteronomy 28. Remember those cycles? You be thrown out of the land, I'll bring you back. Thrown out of the land, I'll bring you back. Those cycles will come to an end one day. And they'll enter into their kingdom. Uh, so he's making that promise here in Amos chapter 9. This is, in my, my opinion, one of the special passages in the Old Testament concerning Israel. But then it's also used of the 10 northern tribes. 1 Kings 12, 16, when all Israel saw that the king did not listen to them, the people answered the king saying, what portion do we have in David? They're talking to Rehoboam. We have no inheritance in the son of Jesse. In other words, they're rebelling against the Davidic line. To your tents, O Israel, now look after your own house, David. So this was a civil war of sorts, a break in their kingdom, north and south. Rehoboam was Judah, Jeroboam for Israel. Second Chronicles 25, 21, 22. So Joash, king of Israel, went up and he and... Amaziah, the king of Judah, faced each other at Beth Shemesh, which belonged to Judah, and Judah was defeated by Israel. So obviously, uh, Judah is not part of Israel in this passage. It's talking about the ten northern tribes as they fight. Back to Amos. Remember the pagan nations I mentioned too? And then he attacks Judah in his sermon. Then he attacks Israel. Judah and Israel cannot be the same thing. Judah, it's interesting, the pagan nations are judged based upon how they treated others. Judah is judged based upon how it kept the law. Same way with Israel, only from verse 6 through the rest of the book. All the way to chapter 9, verse 11, it deals with the sins of Israel. So it's important for us to understand this relationship Judah and Israel are separate. And so you have a clear usage of Israel in the Old Testament as referring not always to the full 12 tribes, but to the 10 northern tribes. Now, when we get to the New Testament, the word Israel doesn't occur as much. 68 times plus five times it's Israelite. In fact, those five times are all in the book of Acts. Uh, during the... Uh, Guys are standing up and saying, men of Israel, five times. It's the Israelite men. It's a different word, but it's still talking about the same thing. It's talking about Israel. So we'll just kind of look at that as 73 times. Uh, it talks about the man named Jacob and the descendants of Jacob, the 12 tribes of the Hebrews. Those are the two in the New Testament. Nowhere in the New Testament do I find Israel defined as C-H-U-R-C-H. -H. I will go to those two passages that are thrown at us here in a little bit. The man named Jacob, the 12 tribes of Israel are mentioned twice. When the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you also shall sit upon 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Matthew 19. And really in the context, there is no way to take that judging the church. Just no way in Matthew's gospel. If you just read Matthew's gospel, sit down, read it all in one sitting. Sometimes, and I know that's hard. When, you need to read Bible books that way. I know that's hard when you're in Isaiah or Genesis. It's hard, but it really does make a difference how you read it holistically through an entire book. And you, it's hard to read the ent entire book of Matthew in one sitting and come away with the idea that he's talking about the church here. doesn't fit. Sons of Israel, and I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel, the sons of Jacob. Okay. 
We know who he's talking about here. Now, by the way, some will say that the, the number here, 144, is 144,000, is not literal. And also, the number 1,000 in Revelation 20 is not literal. And I understand their arguments. They don't want it to be literal. It doesn't fit their scheme. Yeah. I mean, premillennialism is really rather simple. Amen. And here's the deepest thing I'm going to say to you today. Okay, 19 comes before 20. Amen. <laughs> Chapter 19, Jesus comes back. Chapter 20, the thousand years. Amen. And by the way, the thousand years is just the kickoff party for God's forever kingdom. It goes on forever. Revelation 22, 5, they reigned forever. Amen. Not just for a thousand years. That's just the start of it. And I know there's some differences between the thousand years and the uh, eternal state that we have to address. Uh, but it's very important. But when you look at the numbers in the book of Revelation, I wrote an article on this. The literalness of the numbers in the book of Revelation. Let's take the number seven, which is the most prominent number. There were seven churches. How many churches? Seven. Were there really seven? Yes. And there were seven seals? Seven trumpets, seven bowls or vials. Now, some of the things that, that happen when those, like the trumpets blown, some of the things that happen are uh, given in figurative language, but the number is not. And the same way here with the 144,000, there's absolutely no reason to suggest that this is a figurative number. And certainly, there's no reason to suggest that every tribe of the sons of Israel is not straightforward. But there are those who will say that this is talking about C-H-U-R-C-H. -H. Not a chance. It doesn't say that. What does it say? 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. We take it at face value. It's a textual statement. The last occurrence of Israel, the word, in, is in Revelation 21, 12. And it had a great and high wall, talking about the city, with 12 gates, and at the gates 12 angels, and names were written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel, talking about Jacob. So we're, we're back to the Hebrews, the Israelites, the Jewish people. Amen. Sometimes the name Jacob is used as a synonym for the nation of Israel. Romans eleven twenty six, one of our favorite verses about Israel in the New Testament. And so all Israel will be saved. Just as it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. And I think he means the nation of Israel there. The sons and daughters of Jacob. Now, also... When we talk about the descendants of Jacob, people of Israel is mentioned five times, land of Israel two times. Yeah, I kind of expected more than that in the New Testament, but that's all. If Logos is right. House of Israel six times. God of Israel three times. King of Israel four times. Men of Israel five times. Nation Israel, just like that, two times. Luke 24, 21. We were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. I said, Jesus with the, the two witnesses, or the two men on the road to Emmaus, that he's witnessing to them. And they're saying, we are hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Well, what's in their mind? He was going to redeem the nation, the group of people, the Jewish people. And then in Acts 1.6, you remember that. I'm going to turn over there and look at that one. Jesus presents himself alive for 40 days. In verse 3 of Acts 1, he's, it says he's speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. No question. Is Jesus a good teacher? I'm going to hazard a guess that you're right. He's a good teacher. Okay. Now, I also know from Scripture that the apostles were sometimes dense. <laughs> And they didn't always get it. 
right? But do you think after the resurrected Jesus and after 40 days, they would not understand what he had been saying about the kingdom? And so in verse six, when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is that this time? That is the, the time of the baptism of the spirit that he's predicted. Is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom to Israel, the nation, the people, the Jewish people. Apparently his teaching of the kingdom had not changed that in them. They were not thinking of a kingdom in the heart. They were not thinking of a kingdom in heaven. They were not thinking of just a spiritual only kingdom. They were speaking of an earthly kingdom, the one promised by the prophets in the Old Testament, which has spiritual dimensions. But it's an earthly, concrete thing. The Hebrews were concrete about that. And Jesus had a beautiful, as a good teacher, had a wonderful opportunity to correct them if they were wrong. Does he correct them? No. He said to them, verse 7, it is not for you to know times or epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority. It's not for you to know. Right now, you'll know later. But not right now. And then Matthew 8, 10, I'm going to go over there as well. Uh, Robbie, how far, when am I supposed to stop? Where's Robbie? Uh, he's, about 30 it, I got about 30 more minutes. Well, yeah, I got one of those. Hold on. Okay, we got to break at 250. Okay, I'm good. Um, in Matthew 8, we have this amazing passage where uh, Jesus has this centurion come to him. Um, and the, the centurion won't even let Jesus come under his roof. Remember that story? So I'm not worthy of you to come under my roof. Just say the word and my servant will be healed. And what does Jesus say? He marveled, verse 10, he says, Truly I say to you, I have not found such great faith with anyone in Israel. And of course, the centurion is not Jewish. That's problematic for his audience. And then what he says next is even more problematic. I say to you that many will come from east and west and recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. I take that as the earthly kingdom. You can disagree with me if you want, and I'll have a hamburger and a milkshake with you, especially if you pay. Okay. <laughs> but notice he says, verse, but the sons of the kingdom, and I think he's being sarcastic. I think he's talking about the Jewish people who had expectations that they were in because they were Jewish will be cast out into outer darkness in that place that will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. See, the picture here he's giving is there's going to be many coming from east, the Gentiles, many from the east and the west coming together with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. See, the Old Testament is full of Gentiles being part of God's coming kingdom. Israel was always to be a light to the Gentiles. The idea of Gentiles not being in the kingdom, that, that was never taught in the Old Testament. Uh, but somehow, over time, many of the Jewish people had turned it into that. It was just a Jewish-only kingdom. Or maybe you could allow Jewish proselytes or something, but it was very limited and restricted. And so this would have been a shocking statement to them. And it would have, their sensibilities would be shaken, but one thing would not be shaken. He doesn't include those Gentiles as part of Israel. Israel is Israel. Just like the word says, it's not C-H-U-R-C-H. -H. Now there are some special issues, a couple passages. I wanna deal with these three. The two first ones actually use the term Israel. Acts 7 does not. And I want to address these, Romans 9, 6. So let's go over there, Romans 9, 6. Uh, we are all aware of these two key passages and this is 
really the two main passages that are thrown at us, Romans 9, 6 and Galatians 6, 16. Uh, when I'm out speaking in churches that are kind of mixed bag churches, uh, I almost always get these two passages thrown at me. Romans 9, 6, but it is not as though the word of God has failed, for they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel. Now, our tradition has handled this very well for a couple centuries. We have not mishandled this. We've done pretty well. So, um, they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel. Some options. The first option. I'll give you the bad before I give you the good. The statement speaks of Gentiles being part of Israel or the new Israel so that the distinction between Israel and the church is done away with. So in other words, you spell Israel, C-H-U-R-C-H. Is that what that means? That's the way they take it. For they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel. Okay, Jews aren't saved. Some Jews aren't saved, but Gentiles are now part of that Israel. That's the shift they make. So the church as spiritual Israel is in view. Second option. The right option. This statement teaches that not all Jewish people, Israel, are saved. The two kinds of people in view are Jews who have faith in Christ and those who do not. Jewish people must do more than be Jewish to be saved. Of course, we're evangelical born-again Christians. I'm, I'm assuming that. I can't tell by looking at you. but we're born again Bible believing Christian group, a few exceptions. We have some friends here from outside of our circles. And uh, we trust in Jesus and believe all people need to come through Christ. Amen. We say that prayerful, prayerfully and lovingly the best we can to anybody and everybody. After all, Jesus commanded us to share our faith. So we have no choice. Even if we don't want to, and we should want to, we still must do that. Now why is the second option right? Well, look at the context. The entire section of Romans 9 through 11 explains Israel's situation and future. It's all about Israel. The Gentiles are alluded to at times, but the main track of that section is Israel. In fact, I, I believe Paul is answering an objection, a potential objection like he often does. At the end of Romans 8, the beautiful passage we mentioned earlier, uh, that nothing will separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. Uh, people might object, wait a minute, how can I be sure of that promise? After all, you turned your back on Israel. Really? And Paul tells, tells them in Romans 9, 10, 11, no. He hasn't turned his back on Israel. So in the immediate context, it, it the also the 9, 6 understanding that we gave fits the preceding context of the first five verses. Look at that. I am telling the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were accursed, separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren. He's talking about the Jewish people. My kinsmen, according to the flesh, in case you have any doubt, who are Israelites, verse 4. So you can't spell that C-H-U-R-C-H who are Israelites, to whom belongs the adoption as sons and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the temple service and the promises. Whose are the fathers and from whom is the Christ according to the flesh who is over all God bless forever. Amen. That preceding context is very Jewish. 
And so to insert Gentiles into verse six, I think is problematic. It also expresses the statement of nine, seven, and eight. It says, nor are they all children because they are Abraham's descendants. In other words, they're not saved simply because they're Jewish children. But through Isaac, your descendants will be named. It goes back to Isaac as an example. See, it's Isaac, not the other son that's chosen. Um, that is not the children of the flesh who are children of God, but the children of the promise are regarded as descendants. Uh, and then it continues on with some other examples about uh, Jacob and Esau. And so the, the whole section harmonizes with the illustrations of Isaac and Jacob all the way down. Everything in the context here is Jewish. And so it's inappropriate, I think, for us to insert C-H-U-R-C-H -H in this. Now we move to the second passage, and that's Galatians 6.16. And those who will walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. And I underline the word and as well as the, the phrase Israel of God. And here's how our covenant brothers will take this. And those who will walk by this rule, that is the, the rule of the context, trusting Christ for salvation and not circumcision, not following the Judaizers who were trying to force the Gentiles to become Jews in order to be saved. And those who will walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them. And our adversaries will say, even upon the Israel of God. So the option, the Israel of God refers to the church, the new creation of verse 15. Kai is ex expletive or ex exegetical, meaning even. The blessing would be for the church, even the Israel of God. Now, the word Kai, the word and, that's how Kai is most usually translated, can, based on context, mean even. All the Greek students know that. At least most of them, the ones that passed, know that. <laughs> So the blessing would be for the church, even the Israel of God. So there's one people in this particular passage. There's not multiple groups, not two groups, one group. And of course, what does that do? This makes the church equal Israel. So this is the roundabout way of spelling Israel, C-H-U-R-C-H. -H. One category in the verse. Second option, the Israel of God refers to Jewish Christians. Kai is emphatic, meaning and. The blessing would be for the church and also including the Jewish Christians in the church. Don't leave them out. The passage does not equate Israel and the church. There are two categories of people in the passage. Now, why are we right? Or maybe, maybe I should say, why am I right? I haven't polled you to see if you agree with me yet. Number one, the preposition epi, upon, is used for each group, pointing toward two categories. I think it, the grammar leans toward two categories. All other references to Israel in the New Testament refer to Jewish people in some way. The only possible exception is Romans 9, 6, and we just handled that. And it makes sense for Paul, after a blistering attack on Judaizers throughout the book, to remind his readers that the blessing applies to those Jewish people who have come to Christ by faith. I mean, when you read Galatians, you need to see the steam coming off the page because Paul is mad. He's mad. And he's mad at the Judaizers, but he doesn't want the Gentile Christians to just blast all Jewish people. So he includes a separate benediction of sorts for the Jewish Christians 
Don't get mad at them. The blessing applies to them also. And so that's why the word chi means it's normal usage of and, and you have two groups in the passage. Now, now these answers don't satisfy uh, our folks that are oppose us, and they never will. But we have to be honest about the data in the text, and I think I've given you enough details that we have the truth on our side. Acts 7, let's turn there. Acts 7, and this is my final passage to wrestle with. Here, the word Israel is not used. Oh, I thought it was a way to maybe uh, address one of the concerns I have here. In Acts 7, we have speech of S Stephen. And he's talking about, the, this is the Moses, verse 37, who said to the sons of Israel, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. So it's Moses who said to the sons of Israel, this is uh, Stephen talking to the, uh, the people who don't like him there. God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. This is the one who was in the congregation in the wilderness together with the angel who was speaking to him on Mount Sinai. This is the one who was in the congregation. And the Greek word there is ecclesia. King James actually has the translation there. Church. KJV translates it as church in the wilderness. We get some good old timey songs from that. It's the congregation in the wilderness. And the Septuagint uses Ecclesia. Talking about the house of Israel. And our enemies will say, See there, I told you. Ecclesia is applied to Israel. So, Israel could be spelled C-H-U-R-C-H. -H. That's the argument. I hope you don't buy that argument because the word ecclesia, you know, and that's a quote from the Old Testament. Uh, the word ecclesia is just a general Greek term that means assembly. And people have tried to pour all kinds of theology into words. And you want to be careful about that. Some scholars even today use this text to argue that Israel is the Old Testament church. This is part of a doctrinal commitment to the church as the people of God for all time. The church is the collection of the saved of all time. That's, and this is a theological interpretation of scripture rather than a literal understanding. And we don't start with theology. We wrap up with theology and application. And I take application as part of theology for my system. We end with theology. We don't start with theology. We derive our theology based upon solid exegetical work in the text. Yeah, we disagree among ourselves. We argue all the time. <laughs> and we have fun doing it. Amen. <laughs> but we're together on this. Israel is not spelled C-H-U-R-C-H. Now, why do our theological opponents reject seeing Israel as referring to Jewishness in some way? Creedal theology? Well, it's the Catholic version of the, the Jewish people. Uh, have, Israel has forfeited their, their right because they're the Christ killers. Or whether it's the Westminster Confession of Faith brand for the covenant guys who most often today argue for a continuation kind of way. Uh, is, church is the continuation of Israel. Old Testament church, Israel, and the New Testament church, church. Okay, So they kind of do it. Either way, they're, they're married to creedal theology. And that means their starting point is the New Testament. I once gave a paper uh, in a PhD seminar at Dallas Seminary. At the end of the semester, we're supposed to give our papers in class. And 
and I gave my paper, and there were about eight students in the class, and three of them were covenant theology guys. And they got visibly angry with me during the Q&A. Now look at me, I'm a nice guy. <laughs> why, why do they, why do they, why would they get upset with me? And I, they got upset when I made this statement. You could have written a systematic theology book in 75 BC. I said it that way on purpose. I wasn't trying to get them mad, but I was trying to make a point that uh, I can do, I can write my system of theology based upon what the Bible says up to that point. We believe in the progress of revelation. All along the way, I keep revising my book, my system of theology book. But they got mad. Why? Because I had removed their starting point. Say, so one of their scholars has made this statement, pretty, he's probably the extremist, uh, that uh, we can't understand a single verse in the Bible until we've read the whole Bible. Do you think the people standing at the foot of Mount Sinai needed to have the Revelation 22 before they could answer and respond to the Ten Commandments when Charlton Heston came down? <laughs> no. So I, I, you know, I took away their priority. And of course, their New Testament priority, when they come to the Old Testament, it doesn't seem to fit, and so they have to allegorize. That's where that comes from. Their creedal leads them to New Testament priority, leads them to allegory. Uh, and it leads them to spell Israel as C-H-U-R-C-H. Israel means Israel. Amen. I'll leave you with this one thought. Sometimes when I have students who struggle with this, and I really haven't had too many Chafer students struggle with this, but I teach at adjunct for several schools. And when I have students who struggle with this, I try to get them away from the dispensational versus covenant battle. And I throw them over into the Baptist versus Presbyterian battle <laughs> to illustrate the methodological problem, okay? And, the, and I take them to John Murray's little book on Christian baptism. It's probably the best little thing to justify infant baptism in a Presbyterian sense, there is. It really is. And in the preface, he says this, and I, this is what I hammer students with this. In the preface, he says, I can understand how somebody, and I'm a Baptist, by the way, I can understand why people would get enamored with the Baptist understanding of believer's baptism by immersion if you go passage by passage by passage. <laughs> and then he says, you can't do that. You have to come to the Bible, he uses the word organically. He means systematically. What does he mean? Theological. He has a system in place, the creedalism, the New Testament priority, the alleg all that, he has it in place. And so when he comes to the Bible, he basically argues this way. We know that infant baptism is true because covenant theology is true. It's like us arguing, we know that uh, Israel has a future because dispensationalism is true. Well, we're right about that, <laughs> but that's not the way to argue. Right. We argue we know that there's a future for Israel because the prophets and the apostles tell us so. Yeah. End of story. Yeah. Israel means Israel. Israel. Let's don't ever leave that truth. Uh, Okay, I think I'm through. <laughs> okay, thank you, Mike. Um, what's your take on the synagogue of Satan, Revelation uh, two nine, Revelation three nine. And yeah, I is that unbelieving Israel persecuting the churches? I've heard people say those those are not Jewish at all. What's your take on that? I take it as Jewish, and I think it's unbelieving Jews. And was a Smyrna? I forget which church. Pergamos? Which church was it? Uh, it was uh, Smyrna, and, and I think Philadelphia. Philadelphia, yeah. uh, and especially in Smyrna, the Christians were being uh, the Jewish. Um, unbelieving Jewish people, I think, were mad at the Jews who had become Christians 
and were turning them into the Roman authorities because once a year they had to go and, and, and give their allegiance to the uh, Caesar or whatever and they, and they weren't doing that. And so I think it was that kind of dynamic going on. So I take it as Jewish. Uh, thank you, Mike. Do, do those who build that uh, Church Israel idea from the book of Acts, do they try to build other theologies from the book of Acts? Because I think most of us here realize you don't build theology from narratives. Well, people in our camp still do that too. Uh, I think everybody's doing too much theologizing um, from that. But you know, there's a difference between descriptive texts and prescriptive texts. Um, although there are patterns. Sometimes when we don't have a didactic text, we have to look at patterns uh, for things. Uh, but in Acts 1, 6, for example, we looked at that passage, you know, and they take kingdom there as uh, not the future coming kingdom of Israel, uh, but the church is the kingdom. Okay, that's how Mills take church today as the kingdom, the amillennialist. And, and they would be, John Stott, for example, be very consistent in his commentary in Acts in 1 6 and reject the dispensational understanding. Okay, so uh, we just have to read contextually in response to them. But you're right, we need, to, we need to make sure that prescriptive texts drive us more than descriptive texts. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, Dr. Stallard, my question has to do with Revelation 11, 25 to 31. And it starts out uh, with the distinction between the Gentiles and Israel. Now, my question has to do with, if you carry this down to verse 31, it goes back and forth between the Gentiles and Israel, which makes them distinct and different. And in 26, as the verse you had up there, all Israel will be saved. That's future. Okay, are you in Revelation or more Romans? Romans, Romans. Okay. Romans 11, 26, all Israel will be saved. So here's the thing, wouldn't even an allegorical interpretation of the church in that passage mean that the body of Christ would have to be split? Which would be an erroneous interpretation, but then how do covenant theologians make this Israel the church without splitting it up? Well, I don't really know the answer to that question. I'd have to go back and maybe check uh, how they do that. Um, it seems to me you've surfaced a problem for them. So I, I, would, I, I would send an email to Westminster Seminary <laughs> and just copy me on it <laughs> so I can get the answer. Okay, over here. It's not just Israel that they use to make church. They also will use Jerusalem and temple uh, you know, a classic passage in Zechariah 14 where it talks about the nations attacking, they'll say that's attacking the church. Or when it talks about First um, and Second Thessalonians 2, the man of sin seating himself in the temple of temple God, they'll say the that's church. the church. So, yeah. you know, defiling the church. So how can they do that? Well, what, what, what hermeneutic allows them to jump like yeah. that? From well, let me give it one yeah. example. I mean, I think they're all over the map on that. But if you go to 2 Thessalonians uh, 2, and I, I know this because I wrote my commentary on 1 2 Thessalonians, and I had to deal with Gary Beale and his commentary on 1 2 Thessalonians, and his argument for the, the temple being the church in 2 Thessalonians 2, 4, is that every other Pauline use of the word temple refers either to individual Christians as the, you know, our bodies of the temple, Holy Spirit, or the church collectively, 1 Corinthians 3. And he's right about that. But what he misses is that that's the only Pauline passage that is eschatological. It's the only Pauline passage that's talking about the end of days. And so you put together all the Antichrist texts side by side, and I have a table where I do that in my commentary, and you put them all side by side, they match perfectly. And so I think, I think he has to be talking about something Jewish there. Yes. Yeah, I think so. So that, that, but that's a particular thing. They're jumping around all over the place. So I'm not sure there is a cookie cutter way that they abuse. I mean, they come to C-H-U-R-C-H a lot of different ways. 
Okay, um, I've talked to covenant theologians who said, well, even in your hermeneutics, you say that we should interpret difficult passages based on the more clear passages, and that's true. But I've tried to explain to them that that's different than it's different from making our interpretation of difficult passages like Israel on our theology. So would you just comment on explaining how how I could explain that a little bit better to them? You understand what I'm saying? They're saying we interpret the difficult passages based on the clear passages, but they, instead of doing that, they say they actually deter, deter, interpret it by their printed theology. You know what I'm saying? Right. Sometimes we do use clear passages to explain difficult passages, and that's where they would get the thing mixed up. Yeah. Well, we need to be careful throughout the entire process of theology from opening the Bible, first read, exegetical, all the way to application, sermonizing, whatever. Through the whole process, we never give up two things. One is grammatical historical interpretation, okay? And then the other, which is related to it, is the progress of revelation, which is the history part of, the pro of grammatical historical interpretation. And so as we're reading that carefully throughout, we're gonna find, and, and this is what I would say to him about Israel. Now I studied for this, I just did the word Israel. I just didn't have time to do all the other things. There's a lot else out there, and I mentioned that at the beginning. Uh, but I think every one of the occurrences of Israel is clear. Okay, so what we end up doing with them is debating which passage is clear. So we use difficult versus least difficult. You know, we'll argue about that. See, they won't like the fact that, okay, we say Israel means Israel, so we come to the, the passages. Well, I don't go through all 2,000 of them and double check, and I think you got two passages in terms of the word Israel, not some of the other conceptual things like temple, but you have Romans 9, 6, then you have Galatians 6, 16, and that's it. And I think we've handled those okay. And so I think they're clear, they make sense in our system based on what we're doing in the context of the books themselves. And um, I found that discussions about easier, easier ones or harder ones, yeah, I believe that. But when you're arguing with people that disagree with you, they never agree as to what's the easiest passage. You know, might as well be a Mormon talking about baptism for the dead. <laughs> Mike, let me ask you a question. No. I want you to make a connection. <laughs> I, I want you to make a connection here. So those who take, who do not interpret Israel literally as Israel meaning Israel and the church meaning the church, that those who take that, that's a foundation within a theological system that has what sort of relationship to anti-Semitism? Okay, that's a good question. Um, and we can see what Paula says in the next session about that too. But uh, I think one thing I don't want to do, I don't want to accuse all covenant guys today of personally being anti-Semitic. But I do want to, because uh, they've been very upset about that from uh, on our side. And I understand their concern. Uh, but we uh, also want to make sure they understand that the historical roots of their position included some anti-Semitism to develop their positions. And a lot of times, I say the average pastor in the covenant community, he doesn't get that. He doesn't know about that in their past. Because he's creedal. I mean, once he's got back to the Westminster Confession of Faith, most of their guys are happy. <laughs> They're not going back further. Uh, and so I wouldn't say a, say a Presbyterian pastor today is anti-Semitic because he's on the own. I'm not going to say that. Uh, but... He needs to understand the roots of amillennialism in history have some anti-Semitism in it. Yeah, and the roots of this kind of allegorical interpretation was basically the seedbed out of which an Christian anti-Semitism grew, but it's not necessarily so, but it was historically often the case. Yeah, well, and Origen's famous quote where he talks about allegory and, and attacks the Kilius, the premillennialists, for their literal carnal approach. And at the end of that, he, I almost picture him snarling when he says it, 
they interpret the scriptures in a Jewish kind of way. <laughs> so I, you know, there was a little anti-Semitism in the, be- in the beginnings of, of the school of Alexandria. Right, right. Okay, Mark. Yes, sir. I have a, a very good friend who's gone that way, and he's got a burgeoning ministry, and we argue a lot uh, used to about this. And he had a slick little analogy, and I wanted to get your opinion on it. And that is uh, comparing um, Israel becoming uh, the church to a, what would you rather have, a Chevrolet or a, or a Cadillac? You know, if you get a Cadillac, it's that much better. And so if, I guess, God lied to Israel all those years, what, what okay. was your, what's your response to that? Yeah, my response is, the Jews get the Chevrolet and the Cadillac. <laughs> See, the argument is sometimes said another way. You know, if God promised you $10 and gave you $100, did he keep his promise? Yeah. Yes. Of course. And so then they, they use that as an analogy for the land. He promised you Palestine. I'm using that term loosely, okay. Uh, um, but he's gonna give you the world. Did he keep his promise he gave you the world? Well. Yeah, that's, that's not a fair analogy because if they don't get Palestine, say the world, okay, what does that mean? Just a general understanding, I get the world, where do I live? Do I get to live in Palestine? Do I get to have my vineyards? Do I get to live there and prosper there in God's coming kingdom? Uh, that has to happen. But they also own the rest of it, just like Christians are gonna own it all. But I'm not gonna be living and owning a plot of land in Jerusalem. I've asked God to give me Birmingham and uh, Tuscaloosa. <laughs> but, and some people say I can have it. That's, uh. All right, Dr. Stollert, uh, the, uh one of the arguments I've heard uh, from covenant theologians, uh, they use 1 Peter 2, 9, uh, where Peter writes and says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, and so forth. Uh, and so we're saying that right here shows that uh, that the church is actually Israel because he's referring to these, these uh, he would think as being uh, Jewish terms. I, I know the answer to that, but I think it's important to maybe bring well, this up. Well, dispensationalists have multiple answers to that, so I don't know which one is yours. Uh, you know, the idea that it's, you know, the, who's the book written to? Jewish Christians uh, makes that maybe Jewish. That's one answer. Another answer is John Feinberg's answer that dispensationalists are dispensationalists come to passages like that, and that's not the only. I mean, we have other passages like that that don't have that uh, get out of jail free card at the beginning about the Jews. Um, And and so it's an analogy thing. We come to passages where where Old Testament imagery is being borrowed for the church as an analogy, an analogy. Uh, whereas the covenant guys are coming to it with, it's theological. See, they're turning into a theological thing. We see it, it's very natural for Jewish writers like the New Testament authors, except maybe Luke, of course, uh, to use Jewish uh, imagery to make points. And so that's the difference. Feinberg talks about that in uh, the continuity, discontinuity book, uh, analogy for us versus um, theology for them. So, but then we get the, you know, the first part of, of Peter thing, gets, gets a get out of jail free card, yeah. Are we through? Mike, yes. Okay, we're through. <laughs> okay, we're going to take a break for 20 minutes, and we will start promptly at 10 minutes after 3. Okay? So... Take your break. We'll see you when you return.